I think it was probably a couple of years ago now, I was asked to come and do a, a presentation on reinforcement learning. So um, that one was just regular reinforcement learning. This time we're going to be talking about deep reinforcement learning. I, I'm repeating some of what I said before so that I'm sure you don't remember from two years ago. Um, kind of a stripped down version of my previous talk, but I'll explain how reinforcement learning and deep reinforcement learning differ from each other. And um, the reason why I call this bootstrapping intelligence is because that's actually how deep reinforcement learning works. I'll, I'll show you as we go along um, why that's a very apt analogy here. But uh, it's actually very fascinating. I'm surprised it works at all, to be perfectly honest. Um, so um, about me, uh, I uh, graduated from Georgia Tech uh, Institute of Technology with a master's degree in uh, computer science, uh, specializing in machine learning. Currently working with, well, most of you guys, I would imagine, but uh, with MindFire and Get Predictive. Um, and uh, I'm interested in AGI. Um, and I have a very nerdy podcast called the Theory of Anything podcast. And uh, this is actually going to be, I'm, this will be one of my episodes on the podcast. I'll probably do this presentation again for it uh, over the weekend. So let's talk about the types of machine learning. So there's supervised learning, which is kind of regular machine learning. If you normally, if you're hearing about machine learning, it's probably supervised learning. There's also unsupervised learning. So the difference between supervised learning and unsupervised learning, supervised learning has labels from a human. And unsupervised learning is just searching data for, say, clusters that are of similar, let's say it's user data, cluster of similar users or something like that very good for maybe a, like a recommendation engine or something where you're trying to find this person also bought this and trying to find similar types of groups. And then you have reinforcement learning, which is its own kind different than the other two. So of course we're talking about reinforcement learning today. Um, and we're also going to be talking about uh, open, G open AI gym. So are you guys familiar with open AI? I'll take that as a no. <laughs> okay. So OpenAI, OpenAI is a, um, a, a, a group that was started by Elon Musk. You know, I don't really believe it's true that Elon Musk started. I think he helped fund it, but that's how you usually hear about it in the, the media is that uh, Elon Musk um, started OpenAI. So like here's the Wikipedia page on OpenAI. A, a lot of the big breakthroughs in machine learning come out of either OpenAI or, uh, you know, the Google group, uh, Google DeepMind. It seems like if, if, if it's a big hits the media, this is cool stuff, it's usually one of those two groups. Got a lot of money behind them there. Um, so you can see it considered a competitor to DeepMind. Um, they're they're a, a nonprofit, which I think is very loose. <laughs> and the reason why, so Elon Musk is kind of a megalomaniac. So he he believes that he is single-handedly meant to save humanity. And so each of his businesses is actually an attempt on his part to save humanity. So if you look at like um, SpaceX. That is so humanity can learn to go to Mars so that an asteroid doesn't destroy Earth and humanity gets wiped out. And if you look at like um, uh, Tesla, that's to save us from global warming and from um, just the problems that come from fossil fuels. So he made uh, electric cars so popular that now everybody has to compete in that space and they're better than fossil fuel cars. And so, you can see how that would eventually take over for fossil, uh, remove the need for fossil fuels. Um, his open AI is, and also his most recent um, project to try to integrate humans with computers are ways of trying to save humanity from um, AGIs from, do, do you guys know what AGIs are versus AI and how those two differ differ? So AI is just regular artificial intelligence that you're already familiar with. AGI is the stuff we can't do. We don't know how. So that'd be artificial general intelligence. So 
that would be an AI that like from Hollywood, the ones that can talk and think and have to, you know, data, um, the, the kind that don't really exist in real life, that would be AGI. So um, right now, the types of algorithms we use for artificial intelligence, they're super narrow. They can do really interesting things, but only within whatever narrow space that they were invented to work with. If you make a, um, the, our most general algorithm is reinforcement learning. But if you were to make a reinforcement learning algorithm to play Go, that is all it's ever going to really do is play Go. Now, it's a little less, a little more generic in the case of reinforcement learning because typically you can use the same algorithm but plug in different world spaces. I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. And it will work. The same algorithm will work across several different types of problems. But really, the world space is like part of the algorithm. So you're kind of cheating to call that general. Um, so they're, they're always just whatever they're meant to do, they do just that, and that's it. So OpenAI has something called OpenAI Gym. And um, it is just a bunch of, of test areas. It's like a gym. And you can go and you can try your agents out on certain famous tests. Um, so the one we're going to do today is Lunar Lander, but I also have done like cart pole and I've also done um, the taxi problem, all using the same set of uh, reinforcement learning algorithms that I'm going to show. And I've, I've got code that if anyone's interested in this topic, you can use my code as a starting starting place. So it's auto free on GitHub and I'll explain how it works but I've got it split up into a series of different files that each do something different. And there's kind of a base code um, that is everything utilizes the base code. And that's where most of the code is. It's still only a few hundred lines of code. This is not super complicated stuff that we're talking about. And, um, and then there's, uh, you, you do a subclass off of those and you fill in the parts that are missing. So they're just abstract classes. And the net result is, is you don't have that much to do to be able to make this work for different sorts of problems. So I've been able to use the same set of code with just a few minor tweaks for three different uh, reinforcement learning problems. So, okay, so let me get into reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning, uh, it, the things that really characterize it are exploration, delayed rewards, and continuous learning. So it's somewhat similar to supervised learning in that there are no there are rewards for good behavior, similar to like a loss function for supervised learning. But it's also similar to unsupervised learning in that you have no correct result to work with. So it's kind of learning on its own from a signal on rewards instead. Um, however, it's not semi-supervised learning. That's actually a different thing altogether um, that uh, utilizes a mix of supervised and unsupervised learning, So, uh, which is far more similar to supervised or unsupervised learning, whereas re reinforcement learning has characteristics similar, but it's really kind of its own thing. So why was reinforcement learning able to beat the Go master? So are you guys familiar with AlphaGo? And by the way, AlphaGo the movie is free on YouTube. Excellent movie, absolutely worth watching, even with your family. It's a documentary, but it's it's very exciting. And I, I can't even tell you much about it without spoilers. It, why would a documentary have spoilers? Well, you probably want to go watch it. It's very tense. It's If you don't know what the outcome is, it's going to be particularly tense. Um, but it's the showdown between Lee Sedol. I got this picture here of Lee Sedol, the world Go champion, playing AlphaGo. You can see AlphaGo there. There's one of the programmers that's playing on behalf of AlphaGo. And um, this was, they did five matches against each other. And I won't tell you what the outcome was. Um, but uh, um, I already kind of spoiled it. They, they, it did manage to beat him, but I won't tell you like, by how many games or anything like that. Um, but uh, why did this work? So back in my day when I was young, they would talk about, like even just on the news, how we were close to a chess program that could beat the world chess master, but that we were nowhere even near doing that for Go. And the reason why, so the reason why they knew they were gonna be able to beat the chess master is because the basic algorithm that could beat a chess master was already known. It was just a matter of getting something like Deep Blue 
that um, had a clever enough algorithm that could run fast enough and it had enough memory that it could search far enough. Um, but they, they, the basic approach that they used in Deep Blue was the same as every other chess program that's ever been programmed. You, you use a minimax algorithm to look ahead to see, and then you have some sort of board evaluation algorithm that was programmed by a human that would then evaluate how good the board was looking ahead. It would try to look as far ahead as it could. It would get clever about which paths to look down. So it, if you're trying to look ahead just any number of moves, you'd be lucky to get to like between five and seven. If you're clever about only looking at the ones that are promising, you might be able to look ahead like 20 down some really promising path as long as you're not trying too many different variants. So using some combination of those things, they got it to where Deep Blue could look ahead to the point where just no human could beat it. And that was how they beat uh, Kasparov. But uh, the branching factor for chess is it's, it's exponential, so it's horrible, but it's way better than Go's. Go's has got so, such a high branching factor that you just can't look ahead very far. Worse yet, nobody knew how to program a board of evaluation algorithm for it. Basically, a Go master uses their intuition to be able to say, oh, if I make this move, my intuition tells me that's a good move, that the new board's going to be a good, good position for me. And there's some things known about it, about what makes a good board position, but we've got like a really good idea of what represents a good board position for chess. And we don't really know exactly for AlphaGo. So how do you program that, that into a computer? Because of these two reasons, they believe that we would never create an alpha, um, a Go program that could beat the world champion without actually breaking AGI. Well, obviously, it didn't turn out to be true. And in fact, the we beat the world champion. I think it was only 10 or 15 years after the after Deep Blue. So it was much sooner than people expected. OK, so reinforcement learning works off of something called the Markov decision process. So think of think about this as um, mathematically, you would have S, which would be the set of states an agent can be in. You would have A, the action, a set of actions an agent can take. At time T, the agent senses a current state. We're going to call that ST for the state at that time T. Agent takes action T, which would be the action taken at time T. The environment gives reward T at time T in response. You have a state transition function that basically, imagine this, this is just, despite the little Greek symbol, it's just a function. It takes a state at time T and it returns your new, and, and an action at times T and it returns your new state that you arrive in at the, the next time point. So basically just you make a move, you're in a certain state, you make a move and you're in a new state. So imagine you know, chess or something, you are got a certain board, you make a move and the new state would be the new board after your move. Um, then you have a reward function, which says at state at time T and action taken at time T, um, when you take that, it tells you how much reward you got for um, taking that action at time t. Um, in the case of, now this is the thing that's weird about reinforcement learning. In a lot of cases, there's only one reward. It's like winning the game. So how do you handle that? Like, how do you, you have to play a whole game. And then at the very end, depending on who won, it has to be able to say, oh, this is how much this move uh, contributed to the success in that whole game. So that's obviously the difficult problem that you're trying to solve mathematically with reinforcement learning. Um, now, the key assumption with a Markov decision process is that you're never looking at past states. You only look at your current state. So the, the assumption is that all the information that you need is in the current state. Now, think about chess. You don't need to know what the board looked like two moves ago. You only need to know what it looks like in the, in its, the current point and that's all you need to know to figure out your next move so for games this makes perfect sense this may sound limiting but if you think about it, the laws of physics are like this so really the whole world is a markov decision process it, laws of physics do not require you to know um, what the world was like two minutes ago in theory you know what the current velocity is what the current acceleration is what the where the particle is in space and from that you can calculate where it's going to be in the next second or whatever. 
Um, same thing going on here. So it's really a Markov decision process. Sometimes it's very hard to figure out how to put something in real life into a Markov decision process. And you can even cheat. If you really need history, you just make the history part of the current state. <laughs> and you can just declare it to be part of the current state. And that way you can sneak history in if you need it. Um, okay, so an example here, this is a very simple maze, literally a three by three grid with no walls. So you start here and you're gonna go to the goal and you want to get there as fast as possible. So you're either going to go up like this or over like this. Um, you know, maybe you could go like this, but just you want to get there as fast as possible. What's the fastest way? That's what we're trying to solve. So very simple. Um, it's states and actions. Each square is one state. So square one is state one, square two is state two, et cetera. And the actions, I didn't show the ones off the edge. If you go off the edge, just assume you go back again to the state you're in. Um, just to keep it simple. Um, but if you're in state seven and you go north, then it puts you into state four. That would be the state transition function. Um, so this, this is a Markov decision process. Now, an optimal policy is the next concept we have to understand. Basically, it's you take the entire world state, which in this case is not the nine states of the, or the nine squares, and for each one, what is an optimal move? Now, obviously, there could be more than one optimal move, but um, we uh, just want one of them. So in this case, this would be an optimal policy. Every single one of these states, it tells you exactly where to move next to make it an optimal, optimally make it to the goal. It could have been we could have had the arrows go this way instead. It doesn't matter. We just pick one. So this is one of the optimal policies. What we're trying to solve for is the optimal policy, right? And once we have an optimal policy, then our agent knows exactly what to do in every state it can find itself. That's, so that's what we're trying to mathematically solve for. Now, to get an optimal policy, we would, we would need an optimal value function. So basically, we know the goal, let's say it's worth 100 points. So imagine that we discounted the squares next to the goal by 90%, so we're going to give them a value of 90 then the ones next to the 90s by another 90%, we're gonna give them an 81, et cetera. So this one's the lowest value because it's the furthest from the goal. And this one's the highest value next to the goal. And based on that, you could solve for an optimal, optimal policy. You could say, okay, if I'm at 65.71, I look at the two squares next to me. Oh, either one of them is higher than me and um, they're both the same, so I'll just pick one. So I'll either make my arrow go there or make my arrow go there. Just pick one. And from that, you can take this optimal value function. You can build an optimal policy. So now, since we want an optimal policy, now we just need to figure out how to build an optimal value function. So to build an optimal value function, we could use something called the Q function. So the Q function is the same as an optimal, policy, uh, optimal value function, except that it's based on not states, but states and actions as a combo, as a tuple. So imagine it just like this. If I'm in state two, then here's the actions I can take. I can go south, I can go west, or I can go east. Um, and instead of having the value assigned to the state, I assign it to the move. So this going from two to three, that's worth 90 because it's a discount of 90% 90, 90 discount on 100 points you score at, at the goal at state three. Um, so each of these, this one would move me away. So it would be 72.9. If you look back at the optimal value function, basically I'm just assigning the values to the states and to the actions instead. Now, how can you go from a Q function to an optimal val um, value function? Well, you basically just take the maximum. So if I'm in state two, which action is my best one? That's the value I'm going to assign to that state. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So how do I calculate the value function and the Q function then? Well, here is what a state transition function looks like. It's, in this case, it's just a table. I have, um, if I'm in state one and I go down, then that's going to put me in four. So I have that the new state is four. So that would be how I would put a, that'd be the easiest way to create the state transition function. Okay. Um, and imagine I have a reward function. 
that says, oh, state three is worth 100 because it's the goal. And everything else is worth zero. That would be a reward function. That table is a reward function. So, um, you know, input is state in action. Output is new state. Input is state. Output is reward. So um, now in real life, I probably wouldn't use rewards of zero. I would use rewards of negative one so that if you do zero, then it doesn't have incentive to it will the agent will learn too much to wander around so we give it a slight negative reward to um let it kind of learn faster oh i i need to get to the goal fast um but to make the math easier i'm going to pretend like the reward is zero it still works it eventually gets there it just takes longer to converge okay so now if i have let's say i had and in this case i do have the state transition function and the reward function i know what they are because it's just a simple grid and I can see what they are and I've just filled them into this table. I could use dynamic programming to calculate both the optimal value function or the Q function. Um, without getting into how to do it, you can probably just imagine, you know, this is 100 and then you would kind of move to what's next to it and take 90% and you would just keep doing that until it converged. It, it's not too hard uh, to do. Um, so dynamic programming could solve this problem. In fact, any Markov decision process that we have the transition function and the reward function for, we can solve for the optimal value function um, using dynamic programming. So dynamic, dynamic programming would be the way you would do it if you have those two functions. But what if you don't have um, those two functions? Well, there's a trick you can do. And this is what reinforcement learning is. So reinforcement learning is the trick of, I don't know what the reward and transition functions are. So I want to be able to solve for an, optimal, an approximate optimal policy um, using reinforcement learning instead. So what you do is you try to find an approximate Q function. And this right here, this Q function with a state in action, remember that was what the, the uh, inputs were. It just so happens, like in my last presentation, I actually worked out the math for you. I don't need to do that this time. It happens to be that it can be put into this form where you say it's equal to the reward for the state plus a discount factor of the max of the next state um, that I'm going to end up in. And whatever it's, uh, this, this is the transition function. This would be the next state. Uh, and then the next action that I would take. Um, the best action I would take. That's why it's a max on it. So basically, by doing this, we can solve for the Q function, but it's notice that it's the Q function in terms of itself. So it's actually a recursive function. By making it a recursive function like this, they, they, in, in my last presentation two years ago, I did the manipulations to get it into this state. It's actually a little interesting to do that. But once you have it in a recursive state like this, it means that you are now you can now solve for the Q function using just uh, without knowledge of the transition function of the reward function. So basically how you do that is you start with a table of Q values for every state action pair and you have an initial estimate quote in scare quotes for the Q values. In this case, it might be all zeros. The estimate can be very bad. It can be the worst possible estimate and it will still work. And then you follow this algorithm. Basically, the Q learning algorithm is you select an action A and you execute it. You're in a state S. You select an action A and execute it. You see what your reward is. You observe the new state that you're in. Here, we're assuming that you have the ability to always detect what your, new, your next state is. There's, it complicates the algorithm if you can't for sure know what state you're in and you have to detect it by what you can sense. That's called a POMDP um, instead of an MDP. But it's, it's more complicated, but it, it's the same basic idea. Um, and then what you're going to do is you're going to update your Q table using this. Basically, what this means is the new value in the Q table is equal to the reward plus a discounted factor of what it used to be from the previous state that you came from. I'll show you how this works in just a second. But by doing it with this discount factor, which you know might be 10% or 5% or something like that, it will converge towards the right Q values over time. At infinity, it will converge exactly to the right Q values. But of course, since you can't run any algorithm for infinity, um, you can get a good approximation at some finite number. 
what the finite number is depends on the problem. Um, but uh, it's always possible to do it with an MDP. Sometimes it can be hard, but uh, it's always possible to come up with a way to do reinforcement learning to get uh, a good um, answer here. So Q learning in practice. So now we've got um, our Q table here. So it looks very similar to the transition function, but in this case, it's going to be the Q table, which is an approximation of the transition function. Um, and it's got an estimated value of zero for everything. We have our, our um, simple maze, which we know exactly what it is. We know what the states and actions are. Basically, every state has the four directions, up, down, left, right. Um, we've got our basic Q learning algorithm that I explained where you just converge over time. This is how you'd actually implement it in Python. Um, might make a little bit more sense to look at it in that format. But basically what you do is, is you take part of the old value and a little bit of the new value and you, you average them and then it converges towards the correct value over time. Okay, so how does this work in practice? So we start off with our um, reward function is at three is 100. And the Q values are, set, are all set to zero. So basically our robot here is gonna be making random actions, um, moving around more or less randomly because it, it has no, it, it doesn't favor any one position over any, any other. So it's just kind of moving around randomly, nothing's happening, it's all zeros. So if you do that update function I showed you, it's always just updating to zero. So it's currently zero, it moves somewhere, it moves into a new zero state, so it updates this one to be zero again. Nothing changes basically, but it's moving around. Then by chance, just by pure dumb luck, it happens to move into the goal and it scores 100. So here's what happens with our Q table and our reward function. So it says, oh, I was in state two and I took a right and I scored 100 points. So it takes 80% um, of the old value, which is zero, and 20% of the reward plus 90% of the old value. Well, that's going to be 20% of 100. It's going to get a value of 20, and it's going to update two to the right to be an estimated value of 20, okay, in the Q table. Because now it knows, you know, that it, that's just how it flows out from the goal state because of the rewards. It's really the rewards that slowly cause it to converge to the right uh, values. So now it's, it's running around again. It's randomly running around, and it ends up in state one, and it happens to take a right into state two. So now this is its second run through. So it says, okay, um, I'm going to take the values again. So I'm taking 80% of my old value in state one, which was zero. So that cancels out. I'm going to take 20% of my reward, which is, I didn't enter the goal state, so the reward is zero but 90% of the value, which is 20. So it's going to come up with, once you do all that, 3.6. It's going to put 3.6 into one to the right, okay? Now you can see what's happening here is the goal rewards, because of the, the mathematics of the Bell equation that I'm using here, cause the value to slowly update. Um, the further you are away from the goal, the less it updates. And it will actually converge to the right values. Like if you did this an infinite number of times, it will, it, will, it will continue to update the values and increase them until it gets to the point where it's the right value. And then from that point forward, it will always just happen to update to the exact same value. That's just the way the, that's convergence. That's just the way the math works. And so the goal reward flows out backwards as it runs through this maze until finally it gets all the right values, then it can't update anymore. So now it's, it's from state two, it goes into the, the goal state. We do an update again, and now it's gonna update from 20 to 36, and it'll eventually continue to do that until it gets to 90, basically. It'll, it will converge at 90, which is the value we're looking for it to be. So at the end, after running this oh, a few hundred times or something, Maybe I've got values that look something like this. 
We can see that 90 right there is correct for state two going to the right. Um, but uh, it's the other values are approximate, but they're not quite right. But that's okay because they just need to be approximately right to end up with a pretty good um, a optimal policy. So the net result of this would be that um, we would eventually wind up with a Q table that tells us what moves to make because it knows what the best action is for each state. Once we have that, now there is one problem here. Um, let's say that during its random moves, it happens to take the longest possible path. So the, the robot happens to go here, there, 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 there. Once it's done that enough times, by chance it does that 10 times. So now what flowed out went like this. So it's gonna now always take this path. To avoid that problem, we do something called the explore exploit trade-off. Every so often, we make a random move. Maybe initially we make all random moves, and then over time we reduce how often we take a random move. You never put it quite, during training, you never put it quite to zero though. You, you always leave a few random moves. By doing that, you're guaranteed that it'll try to explore and find better paths. That will force it to converge to the optimal policy, okay? Now, when I did this with a, a maze um, using similar code, this right here would be the maze. You can see the, the ones here are walls. These two fives are pits. I didn't talk about pits, but imagine that um, if you fall into a pit, you get you score negative 100 or something. Um, and then in this case, the, the moves that you make are random, partially random. So if I say I move up, there's a 90% chance I move up, but there's also a 10% chance I move to the side, one of the sides or something like that. Um, so there's a chance that if you try to go through here, you'll fall into the pit. So the optimal path wouldn't be, even though it's quickest to the goal at three, this is the starting point right here, it's quickest to go like this, that would be dangerous because then you have to risk falling into the pits. So instead it explored out this path, goes around the walls, and this is the path, that it, the optimal path to um, get to the goal. That is in fact, you can tell an optimal policy. And here's the actual policy that it used, starting right here. You can see that it, this, the arrows represent where it's telling it to go. This is an arrow down, this is an arrow to the side, this is an arrow up. And you can see that it's not quite an optimal policy. It's, you know, some of these areas that it has no reason to explore very much, like these two um, are kind of an endless loop. <laughs> so if you ever wound up in those, that'd be a problem. You'd have to wait for, to randomly fall out of one of those, to get back into a, the right spot. But for the most part, this is really close to an optimal policy. So this is gonna work and this agent's gonna perform well and it's gonna seem intelligent. I did this for uh, in class using a, a regular Q learner, um, doing stock buying and selling. And this is my result right here. Does a lot of buying and selling. Um, it comes up with, uh, this is the training. So it does really well on training. Um, when I tried it on actually uh, on the, you know, uh, a set it hadn't trained on. It doesn't do nearly well this well. It did fairly well. The only problem was, is that like this was trained during 2008 and this is on JP Morgan, which didn't recover for years. So it does fairly well on JP Morgan because JP Morgan stayed down for years after 2008 when I trained it. But like Microsoft took off like a rocket. So when I tried running this against Microsoft on the same training set in 2008, it did make money, but nowhere near as much as if you just bought Microsoft and held it. So it really only works if the stock market's having similar patterns to, its re to the past that it was trained on. <laughs> of course, that's the problem with trying to use something like reinforcement learning with the stock market is that you're kind of making a bet that the past and the future are going to be the same, which isn't necessarily true. Okay, so let's talk about how to use reinforcement learning now to do learn, Lunar Lander. So if you guys remember back in the old Apple II days, uh, Lunar Lander was a game where you would fire your engines on the side and down. You would try to land your Lunar Lander um, between the two flags there. Um, it was uh, invented in 1973 on a deck. Atari published it in 1979. Um, it seems like I remember an Apple version. But uh, it was a really popular game, you know, way back in the 70s. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to train 
um, uh, a reinforcement learning agent to play Lunar Lander well. And uh, this is one of the things that Open Gym has. It has a Lunar Lander environment that we can use. So that makes it nice and easy for us. And here's the problem with Lunar Lander though. It doesn't have a discrete set of states. It's continuous, okay? It's, uh, so there's no way to use a Q table to do it. I'll show you why that's the, that's the case. So here's the actions for the game. You can do nothing. You can fire your left orientation engine, your right orientation engine, or their main engine. All the actions are discrete. They're either on or off. That's good. So, so far, so good. Um, now here's the states though. The state for this game isn't a single number, states one through nine, like with that Q table maze I was just showing you. In this case, it's a, it's a tuple of eight values, an X position, which is a real, a Y position, which is a real, X and Y velocity are reals, angle the lander is a real, and then it's got two booleans if the left or the right leg are in contact with the ground. Of those, only the last two are discrete. Everything else is, is continuous. So how would you put that into a Q table? Because a Q table, a table is by nature discrete. Okay, so that's a problem. You cannot use regular reinforcement learning for a problem like this because of that. Um, so one thing we could do is we could uh, discretize. So I tried this actually um, at one point, didn't go very well, but imagine here for like the stock selling, um, it's got continuous numbers and yet I could still use a Q table for it. And the reason why is because it's not that hard to turn any signal into a discrete signal. You can see that it's immediately obvious that this discrete version of that one, they look pretty similar. So that's good enough for like the stock market. It, but for a Q table, I tried making a table with a million entries and it just, it wasn't even close, right? I mean, like there would be a million entries in this Q table and I'm trying to discretize the environment doing that. You would, the number of games you'd have to play to fill up that environment would, it might be billions of games, right? It's that, that environment stays at zero, almost all of it zero forever. Um, it's just too big of a table to fill in. And then anything above that, you're starting to run out of memory in your computer. So even though I could, in theory, discretize, I, you know, the, I just can't really train the agent enough to be useful because it, it's just too big of an area. And honestly, it's still no good because that's still, it's, it's not very, um, it's not very fine grained, even at a million, it's not very fine grained. So even if I could train it enough, it still probably wouldn't play the greatest. So um, how might we approach this then? Well, it, neural nets are theoretically, are approx can approximate any function. So there's a paper called multi, a very famous paper called Multilayer Feedforward Networks are Universal Approximators by Kurt Hornick. And he proved in that paper that neural nets can, can are universal approximators. There's no function, there, any function in the world can be, a pro in theory, can be approximated on a neural net. Now, the problem with saying that is, is that he's talking about over the space of all possible neural nets. So no one neural net is a universal approximator, but the space of all neural nets is. So, but that's still good. We got proof that that's the case. And neural nets have a lot of history of doing really well at approximating functions like this. So a Q table is just a function. In fact, everything in life is just a function. So what if we took this Q table that we can't possibly make work and we just approximated it using a neural net? So this is what separates deep reinforcement learning from regular reinforcement learning, is that we're ripping out the Q table and we're replacing it with a neural net to approximate it. So now we got a new problem. How do you train a neural net to replace the Q function? So normally we would use supervised learning, which requires a human label. Well, you know, no human is going to know what the right move is in that particular state, right? I mean, the state, remember the state is that tuple of functions. So there's no way for a human to label what the best moves are. There's no ground truth to use. So because of that, how do we actually train uh, a neural net? So somebody had this crazy idea. He said, let's, they said, let's flip the neural net train itself. It, it, and again, this doesn't sound like it would work. 
um, basically you let the neural net use itself as its own ground truth. This is why I call this bootstrapping intelligence. Um, it's, it, honestly, it sounds absurd, but it actually works in real life. Um, sometimes it's hard to get it to train. Um, I'm going to show you a couple, you know, some fairly good uh, training runs, but when you run it, it's just kind of hit or miss. <laughs> sometimes it doesn't train well. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it does okay. Sometimes it does really well. Sometimes it starts to do well, and then it drops off the deep end and does worse than random. And it's, it's crazy what, what happens. But with a few good runs, you can come up with something that actually works. Okay, so here's how we would go about this. We're going to have a tuple of what state we were in, what action we're, we took, what the reward was, and what the next state was, and then if we're done or not. Remember, a state would be a tuple of eight. Um, state is all eight values. Uh, take the action we're taken. And then um, what we're going to do is we're going to just keep a history of those. So every single state, every single move in the environment, we keep, the, uh, keep a history of those things. And then we grab 100 at random, and that becomes our mini batch that we're going to train our neural net on. And the code looks something like this. So imagine the first page of code. I'm actually taking, you know, the state, the action, the rewards, and I'm turning them into a big array out of the samples that I've collected. Um, so that I've got a big group of all of them in different arrays. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up with a, oops, let me go back here, um, a predicted value similar to regular um, supervised learning. I'm going to come up with a predicted value. I'm going to compare it to an actual. But I don't, remember, I don't have any actuals. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to predict the action for the state that we were just in. So we're in a state. I predict what the action is going to be. And that's the action I'm going to actually take. Then I'm going to predict um, the action for the new state um, that I wound up in. So remember, I've just made a move and I wound up in a state. So I say, what was my prediction of what I should have done? And what was the, what was the actual predicted value for the next state after that? I'm going to use that plus the rewards to calculate an actual. So basically, I'm using one step ahead on the neural net, the next state, as my ground truth for the previous state is basically what I'm doing. Okay. Again, I know it sounds crazy. The reason why it works is because these rewards are getting added in. And remember, with reinforcement learning, the rewards, the fact that you have a real-life reward taking place, forces a convergence over time to the right values. Same thing happens here with neural nets. And then having all that, I'm going to train using the actual values, the, what I call the actual value, the fake actual values. And over time, it will start to learn. It will start to play better and better. So basically, the end result is we rip out the Q table, replace it with a neural net that's going to approximate it. Um, uh, this, this replaces the Q table, and we only need to determine, given a state, which action to take. Um, the neural net naturally generalizes well. Neural nets are good at generalizing. So the fact that, that um, I couldn't train enough times with a, a real Q table, that, kind of, that problem is now kind of solved because neural nets naturally generalize. So if it's in a state, and this other state isn't quite the same, but it's similar, the neural net will automatically treat them as the same state. That's what neural nets do, right? Um, and so because of that, I don't need to have billions of training now. I can do it in a few hundred. On top of that, I've now solved the continuous versus um, discrete problem. The neural net just takes an input and it gives an output. It does it, whatever training and magic of machine learning just works. And it now does not care that you're giving it a continuous value because it's going to treat similar continuous values as similar. OK, here's the results from my actual training. You can see that um, it slowly improves over time. It takes a while. It still continues to have failures uh, over time. You can, one thing that's interesting is that it almost always starts off better and then takes a dive at first. For whatever reason, this game, Lunar Lander, random firing isn't completely terrible. <laughs> and so 
when it first starts off, it starts off with random firing and it, you know, it scores like a negative 50 or something. And then it, it kind of thinks it knows something and then it tries to do that. And it ends up, you know, doing a giant crash and going to negative 400. Then it learns from that and it gets better on the next try. Then it crashes again and it kind of goes back and forth for a while and it oscillates. And over time, the oscillations start to move up and to do better and better and you get fewer crashes. Now with the final, um, agent after it's been trained. This is what it looks like when I've run it a hundred times. There's only one crash here. And that's, that's not even a strong crash. Only one that went below zero. Everything else, it scored positive, And most of them, it scored over a hundred. Well, it looks like all of them, it scored over a hundred, except for this one crash. So it, it's really starting in, you know, on average, it's looking like it's in the two hundreds. So this is actually looking pretty good. Um, if you can average over 200, I think that's considered solved for this problem. Okay, so my code base now. Um, if you want to try th doing this for yourself, one warning, the setting up the environment for OpenAI is rather difficult. Um, there's, I, I have yet to document it, and I don't remember how anymore. So one of these days, I'll go back and I'll do it again and I'll document it. But uh, I just Googled around, and if I can do it, probably anybody can eventually figure it out. And you get it set up, and it'll eventually work. Uh, I built this using Python and Keras and TensorFlow. So I have a Q learning interfaces file. Um, let me. So here it is. Here's the file in GitHub right here. Q learning interfaces. This is the main logic file. It has two interfaces, um, a Q model interface and a Q learning interface for um, it's the basic interface that is the similarities between a Q table and a deep reinforcement learning version of it. Same thing for the learner. So a learner would be an agent that needs to learn. The table would be the, um, the function, the, the Q function that it's trying to approximate. Um, and 90% of the code for both types is in this file. It's only 394 lines. So we're not talking about something super difficult here. Um, the code even starts with semi-good hyperparameters. The Q table dot um, py uh, script it contains the actual code for a real Q table, a classical and a for that when you'd use with the classical Q learner. The Q learner dot py that would be the Q learner for an, a real Q table. Need, both of these are under fifty lines of code. Then there's an environments dot py which is a wrapper or, that can be used either around open. AI gym or for anything you build yourself. Now, the reason why I did that is so that um, you can build your own environments. I, I intended to try like a maze and make my own because that doesn't exist inside of open, open AI. So I, it basically, it's a wrapper that just says, reset the environment, make a step in the environment. So step the environment one step based on an action and then render the environment visually. If it's got those three, um, abilities, then it, it matches the wrapper and open AI, any of the open AI environments will work with it. Um, you have a DQN model. Uh, so DQN would be the Q, the uh, deep learning version of the Q table. So this is like a deep Q network that replaces the Q table um, on top of the interface in the original file. Uh, a DQN learner, which would be the learner that goes with it. And then finally the open gym examples which is just a bunch of examples of different open gym things I've tried. And you can use the exact same code for all of them. Um, so the reason why I use this approach is I'm trying to use it. So there's a single base code that has most of the code. And then there's just a little bit that you change out, whether you're doing a Q table and standard reinforcement learning or the, um, the deep reinforcement learning instead, this really demonstrates that all you're doing is you're ripping out the Q table and you're replacing it with a neural network. It makes it very clear that's all you're doing. So I, I wanted to do that in the code to make that clear that that's the only real difference between the two. Um, I, as I mentioned, I have a, a code base out on GitHub for anyone who's interested. And then here's the links for Open Gym. If you go to my uh, GitHub page, you can also find this presentation there. And then if you really want to get started, I would actually recommend learning Keras. Uh, by Francais Chalet. Um, he's the one who invented Keras. 
So this is a really good book. It teaches you not just about Keras, but about b- the basics of all machine learning um, using Keras. So now let's go ahead and let's do a demo of what the actual agent looks like. Um, going to run this. Now this is my best run, my best trained example. So all of these are gonna succeed. Keep in mind that I didn't program any of it. It it just learned this on its own. We'll only watch five of these and it'll quit. You can see the scores over here as to what it's scoring as it finishes each one. That's really, really cool. Uh, and I have a question while it's playing. Yeah. I noticed that the scores are close, but a little bit different each time. And I, I'm wondering if my understanding is correct, that if this was using a, an ideally trained uh, Q table, using Q learner, that those scores would probably be identical each time, but they're different in this case because you're using a neural network instead. Is that correct? Now, notice when it lands what happens. The environment actually changes. So it's playing a slightly different game each time. And I think right. it also okay. it, I think it also gives it slightly different starting conditions. So it's not if it were exactly the same environment with the exact same starting conditions, it would it would make the exact same moves every single time. Even with the neural because, network. Even with the neural network, yes. Okay. Neural networks are still deterministic. Well, they're yeah, they're they'll generalize, but there's yeah. Um, but because it's sense. getting slightly different starting conditions, slightly different initial conditions, like think of chaos theory, slightly different initial conditions, um, the neural network has to really do a different problem each time. And it's generalizing well enough that it's scoring high. So we only got one that was below 200 here. So my average is definitely over 200. And so this one would be considered having solved the problem. Um, now, if you take a look at my code here, I have the cart pole. In fact, let me see if I can. Um, I don't know if I've got. I don't know if I've got a uh, example of the cart pole. I'm going to find out live here. May error if there's no file. Nope, it's working. So the cart pole. Same algorithm, but it's now doing the cart pull instead. Obviously, when I say it's the same algorithm, it's the same basic algorithm. It's the same, that, that first file I showed that had the 400 lines of code, it's that one. But then um, it, there's always a little bit of code you have to make to explain how this environment is different than other environments. Okay, this one's pretty good, so it'll take a while for it to fall over. <laughs> um, let me show you, like, with the cart poll, the cart poll training, you can see that I have a specific cart poll learner that's separate from the uh, um, Lunarlander one. Well, but it's only, this is it, right? I mean, like, it's just a handful of lines of code where I have to map each environment to... Uh, the interface that I need. And it's it's not that difficult. Here's the taxi learner. I, I haven't shown you taxi. That, that was not impressive to look at, so I'm not going to show you that one. Here's the lunar lander le- learner. They're all pretty similar, right? They, they've got different, um, slightly different information on each of them. But uh, basically, I just have to write one for each one. Um, they have, uh, basically, the main difference is actually here, where I grab 
um, the gym dot make and I have to grab the right environment for it. But everything else looks almost identical. Um, and then the, the other difference would be, huh, there isn't that much else. <laughs> so they're very similar for each one. Um, you don't have to do very much that's specific and it will actually learn. Now, I think one of the things I did do though is that I'm kind of using the same neural net for each one. So I'm using the same neural net um, model for the cart pole and for the lunar lander. In this case, those two are simple enough that the same, the one that works for lunar lander will also work for cart pole because cart pole is simpler. Um, but in real life, like you may have to rip out the the neural network and make one that's appropriate for your problem. Neural nets are specific to the model. So one model isn't necessarily going to solve a different problem well. So you may have to make it a lot deeper. If I were to look at the DQ model here, um, let's see. Here is where I'm actually building the neural net. So, um, Top layer is 150 nodes. Middle layer is 120 nodes. Um, and then the final layer is just whatever number of actions I pass to it. So cart pull only has two actions and Lunar Lander has four um, or three, three it was. Um, so it's slightly different neural nets, but it's only the final layer. The, the rest of the layers are the same. Uh, here I'm telling you to use the Atom Optimizer. I'm compiling it. I'm saying that it's a sequential model. Um, and I'm telling you that I'm going to use a, bat, a mini batch of 100 each. Uh, each of these, there are like, like if you were to use my code, but you didn't want my default settings, there is like a property you can use to reset it to something else. Um, and that's it, right? This is the whole deep learning portion right here. And I'm using the same one for both cart pole and for lunar lander. Um, and that's really all there is to it. There's not that many files. There's not that much code in the files. This interface is, is kind of the main one. And like I said, it's looks like it's actually, I said it was under 400, but it looks like I've added a bit since then. So it's slightly over 400 now. And this is both a regular Q learner and a, the deep version of it. So, um, or it's the, ba the basics would be the same for both, is what I mean to say. But uh, the difference is just in the difference between a, an actual Q table would be in the Q table file versus the DQN model file. But you'd use one of those, not both, depending on whether you're doing regular reinforcement learning or deep reinforcement learning. All right, any questions about this? <laughs> I have some questions, but I'm not sure if they're off topic or not. Go for it. I don't care. So your um, lunar lander appears to be a semi-stochastic problem, e.g. that terrain's changing a little bit. Maybe your initial conditions are changing a little bit. <clears throat> it seems like, though, if it was stochastic enough, <laughs> that it would completely upset the neural net's ability to create any kind of um, generalization. Is that yeah. true, or am I... That is true. Okay. So anytime you're doing, so this is the truth about machine learning. There's always this inductive assumption that the past and the future are the same or relatively the same, similar enough. If that's not true, all machine learning fails, right? I mean, it's, you think about that, like, let's say you have a face recognizer. If aliens came and joined us, it's not going to recognize the aliens because the past and the future aren't the same anymore, right? So you, you often you're picking problems where you've got good reason to believe the past and the future are the same, but like the stock market, the past and the future are never the same. So you have to intelligently know in this case, I think they're going to be similar enough or I, you have to update it on a regular basis so that you're retraining it. There, there's various things you can do to, and remember reinforcement learning, continuous learner. So you could make reinforcement learning, um, keep learning so that if the environments did start to change too much, it would start to relearn. Um, that would be possible to do. Uh, I don't think you could do that quite as easily with deep reinforcement learning because you have to have the neural network, but with regular reinforcement learning, it certainly can do that. But yeah, it, there's, there's always the problem that um, 
if the environment changes too much and it's not the same environment that you trained on, it will just do inappropriate things. Now, think about like the Atari. There was like this big breakthrough where they had reinforcement learning that could play Atari games. Like that was all over the media. They proved that even little minor changes, like changing the color of the screen, things like that, would cause it to completely go wrong. <laughs> so it, it's brittle in that way. So you also explained that this uh, won the Go Championship or whatever. <clears throat> I'm confused, though, how this could ever work with an adversarial set of conditions. So um, there's really no difference with adversarial set of conditions. So think about like how a Go board is just a finite set of states, very, very large finite set of states, but it's still a finite set of states. You could never make a Q table large enough to hold it all. And it would have the same problem where you'd have to play trillions of games or something to fill the, the Q table in. So they use a neural network instead. They did a whole bunch of tricks. I don't even know most of the tricks they use, but I know the basics is you use a neural net instead. And what you do is you're, you're only using the reinforcement learning to come up with the board evaluation algorithm. So the board evaluation algorithm for, for Deep Blue was programmed by a human, and it was human intelligence. No, remember I said no human knows how to do that for um, Go, so they used machine learning instead. So the machine learning came up with the board evaluation algorithm, and after playing billions of games, its board evaluation algorithm is better than a human. And in fact, it can, in one move, it can look ahead one move, and it can play at professional levels. Only looking ahead. So you don't even need the min-max algorithm anymore because the board of evaluation algorithm is so good. It, and basically, machine learning is less like artificial intelligence and more like artificial intuition. So a neural network gives the computer the intuition for this board, This, if I make this move, the new board's better than if I make this move. It can try each move. It can see which of those its neural net thinks is the best new board, and then it picks the best one. That's basically all there is to it. Cool. Thanks. So I guess I should maybe – let me clarify one thing because I think maybe I understand your question. Um, the fact that it's stochastic itself is not a problem. It's really if the environment changes too much that it's a problem. So the fact that you're playing a, a, a player and you don't know what move they're going to make, that's still a finite set of moves. And so it can still learn, right? It's going to come across. And what would happen, though, is that sometimes the, the player would get it into a state that it hadn't trained on. and It would start to make really bad moves. So they've gotten to the point where it can play enough games that doesn't happen anymore. But during the games with AlphaGo, they called that hallucination, where it would think it was winning when it wasn't. Um, and it would start to hallucinate that it was winning. And there was always this, this fear that playing Lee Sedol, he'd get it into a state it hadn't trained well on. And, it would, and then it would start to lose, it would start to make like random moves. It would lose in embarrassing ways, right? Um, so that was like a constant threat. And, you know, this is kind of a spoiler for AlphaGo the movie, but that, that was the thing that they were constantly in threat of is that Lisa Dahl is going to get us into a state where it just starts making really stupid moves. And there was a, a near constant um, tension over that, that he might, because he's the world best player. He might make some creative move that's just never been seen before and get it into one of those states. And then it's going to be embarrassing. So, so stochasticity on itself isn't a problem as long as it's still a finite set of states. It's really if the states change that it's a problem. If, if you're doing a different maze than what it trained on, then it's really got a different world space. And so now, unless it's very similar, it's not going to work anymore. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Why would I choose to use the QLearner if I can use a neural net instead? There's got to be a benefit to it, right? Um, yeah, good question. So a QLearner has guarantees that it will work. A deep, uh, a deep version has no guarantees of anything. 
It's just a matter of, can you personally get it to work? <laughs> and um, some people are much better at it than others, right? I, I was my, one of my professors in machine learning, um, Michael Littman, who's super famous in machine learning circles, all his grad students tried to um, teach, you know, tried to do like um, Othello or something like that. They would try to write uh, programs that could play these games using neural networks. I don't remember if it was specifically with deep with reinforcement learning or not. Maybe it was because that's a good way to play games. And there were there was papers out there from a guy who was the first one to ever get it to work. And he had all these successes and the grad students could never replicate the success. <laughs> and so uh, Michael Lippmann said, he's kind of just a neural network whisperer, right? He's, he's just so good at getting neural nets to do what he wants them to do. And your average person just can't do it. Um, so it, it really, the real reason why you would probably want to use a regular Q learner is because then you have the mathematical guarantees that it will converge over time, where with uh, the deep version, it's just really seat of your pants. Can you get it to work? Okay, so if I were to use a neural network, is is it practical or just silly to say I'll start with a neural network and try to use it to train a Q learner or to train a Q table? and then have a Q-learner take over and continue that, would there be any improvement at that point? Or do you still have the same problem that it can't explore enough to really populate the Q-table with, with effective values? It depends on the size of your world space, you know, the number of states you have. So with a Q-table, um, I mean, it very quickly explodes into a table that's just too large. So even when I was trying to do um, the stock market, the vast majority of the table was set to zeros. It, it still worked okay. Um, it, it, there was enough similarities between the states it was going to transition through that it could find stuff. But um, it, it, you very quickly end up with a Q table that's just too large. If the, the space is small enough, a Q table will work really well, probably better than a, a, a neural net. The real reasons why you go to a neural net is either because your Q table is too big or because it's, it's continuous. So there's, there's no way to use a, a regular Q table on a continuous space. It just can't be done. I mean, just think about that. How do you make a table for continuous space? Other than discretizing it, it just can't be done. So that would be kind of when you would want to go to a, a, the deep version. Cool, thanks. All right, any other questions? Thank you, guys.